Chapter Twenty Four of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Asia, by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Indochina. We are in Hanoi this morning. Most of us had never heard of it before we came to Hong Kong, but we now know that it is the capital of Indochina and the chief city of an extensive country in Asia. Indochina belongs to the French and is controlled by them it is much larger than france and it contains about eighteen million people who are mostly of the yellow race they are somewhat like both the chinese and the malays but in many respects are different from either they are darker than the chinese and lighter than the malays who live farther south they are by no means so strong a race as the chinese and are far behind them in civilization nevertheless they have their own language and customs the most of them are farmers engaged in rice raising much of the country is irrigated and parts of it are so rich that it is called the granary of south asia a great part of indochina is wild and unsettled it is to a large extent a tropical jungle in which elephants and tigers roam and it has also many venomous snakes it has deer and wild birds there are alligators in the rivers and so many fish that a great industry is carried on in salting and smoking them for the market this is especially so about ton lay sap a lake in the southern part of the country indochina is well watered in some places the annual rainfall is so great that if it remained where it fell it would flood the country to a depth of seven and one-half feet and drown out the people the streams overflow to such an extent that they cover vast areas they bring great loads of silt down from the highlands and at the time of the floods most of the soil is composed of earth washings from the himalaya mountains the chief of the rivers is the mekong which rises on the plateau of tibet not far from the source of the yangtze and spreads out over a wide delta through which it empties into the pacific the mekong is one of the world's greatest rivers if it could be laid upon north america it would reach from the arctic ocean to the gulf of mexico and its load of rich fertilizing matter would exceed that of the mississippi in this respect the mekong compares favorably with the nile and its mud is used in much the same way but we shall see all this as we go on with our travels let us take a walk through hanoi the capital of tonkin the province which adjoins china the city is situated on the red river about sixty miles from the port of haiphong where we have landed it has a railroad connecting it with the coast and there are other roads which go several hundred miles northward into some of the richest parts of south china we see little steamers in the red river which flows by the town and notice the smoke coming from the stacks of the new cotton mills which have been recently erected hanoi has electric street cars and electric lights and in its centre is a foreign quarter containing the palace of the governor-general some fine european houses large stores and hotels a museum and a botanical garden there is a little lake in the middle of the city and not far away is the citadel or fortification surrounded by a wide and deep moat it is there the troops live the native town contains most of the people they dwell in cane huts thatched with palm leaves having many little villages which are here joined together lining the river for several miles they seem to work hard but they have but little skill and are less intelligent than any people we have yet seen returning to the seacoast of haiphong we take ship for saigon the chief port of cochin china situated on the saigon river forty miles from its mouth in the lower part of its course the saigon is as wide as the mississippi and deep enough for big ocean steamers the water is clear and opalescent jellyfish are floating about the land is low and here and there the banks are bordered with coconut palms great pelicans with big yellow sacks under their throats stand in the water near the shore and alligators are frequently seen we anchor amid junks which are taking on rice for export to china each boat has two fat eyes painted on the sides of its prow and the sailors are chinese 
there are french and german steamers loading for europe steam launches owned by the foreign officials and merchants and also many small native craft landing we find a french quarter somewhat like that of hanoi and a native city of rude houses and huts in the french town the streets are wide with pavements of brick and the houses have gardens filled with tropical trees the native houses are largely of cane and palm leaves there are many warehouses and not a few rice mills containing modern machinery the europeans are chiefly french dressed in white cotton and we see well-dressed french ladies carrying parasols they ride about in carriages and seem to lead a gay life away out here in asia the natives of cochin china wear black clothes of much the same style as the chinese the women have long coats and wide flapping trousers which fall to their feet they go bareheaded and their long glossy black hair is bound in a knot on the neck the men wear their hair long and tie it up in a twist on the crown the women do not bind their feet like the chinese and they walk very straight their chief ornament is a collar of silver or brass as thick as a lead pencil and their dresses are fastened at the neck with buttons of gold silver or brass most of the babies are naked and the children wear but little clothing until they are pretty well grown nevertheless all are decorated with jewelry during a visit to saigon i saw a girl of four years who wore a gold collar gold anklets a gold bracelet and ten finger rings and nothing else many of the women seem charming at first sight but their beauty disappears as soon as they open their mouths we then see that their tongues and teeth are as black as our boots and that their mouths are filled with what seems to be blood they keep their jaws moving and now and then spit out a bright saliva the men and children do likewise and we ask if the whole race has sore gums the reply is that they are chewing the beetle a habit which is common throughout farther india malaysia and even in our philippine islands these people take pride in the custom saying that any dog may have white teeth but only those who can afford the beetle can have beautiful black ones the beetle nut grows on the araca palm it is of about the size of a walnut and has a green skin and a soft spongy interior which tastes bitter it has much the same effect as tobacco upon those who use it stimulating the nerves and taking away hunger the native cuts off a piece of the nut and adds a pinch of lime and a bit of tobacco he puts this mixture into his mouth and chews and chews we take gin rickshaws and drive about saigon the streets are of red earth so pounded down that they are as hard as iron and as smooth as a floor they are bordered with trees and we ride under palms loaded with coconuts and torch trees as tall as an oak with flowers the color of fire there are other trees bearing blue blossoms and fan-like palms which seem to whisper to one another as the wind blows through them we visit the stores and find them filled with french goods the country has a postal system run by the french and saigon has newspapers in the french language we meet french officers and many native soldiers in french uniforms leaving the foreign quarter we go by railroad to the neighboring native town of Cholon, where we visit the markets the business here is done in little cells under a great roof in what is known as a bazaar the merchants sit in their cells surrounded by their wares there are many jewelry stores and we each buy a silver collar to take home jewelry is the savings bank of the common people and not a few have all their wealth on their persons most of the merchants in the markets are women and girls here and there are money changers from india who have little piles of gold silver and copper coins on tables before them the silver pieces are of one dollar twenty cents ten cents and five cents each the copper coins are in cents and one-fifth cents each piece having a hole in it that may be strung upon strings leaving the bazaar we visit some of the rice mills which are filled with modern machinery and then go back to saigon End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Siam and the Siamese. We have taken a French steamer and have come around Cape Cambodia into the Gulf of Siam and entered the mouth of the Minam River at a few miles south of Bangkok. We are now to visit the Kingdom of Siam which forms the heart of the indo-chinese peninsula the country is about five times as large as the state of kentucky and only a little smaller than germany or france it is a land of mountains and valleys with low plains cut up by rivers which are often joined by canals its chief stream is the minam with which its tributaries forms a great highway of trade far into the interior siam has a tropical climate with heavy rains from may until november after the rains it is cool until march when the hot weather comes on and everything steams in some places the rainfall is enormous the streams overflow and in the wet season much of the country becomes a vast lake at such times the people go from village to village and from city to city in boats the houses are built upon high posts to be out of the water and also on account of the tigers and snakes there are so many streams that the people live largely upon them many have houses afloat and in bangkok the capital there are tens of thousands who are born live and die on these floating houses the population of siam is seven or eight millions they are of the yellow race and their original home was central and south china from where their ancestors moved down into siam there are several different siamese tribes those of the northern part of the country known as the laos people having their own language and customs and being less civilized than those of the south in the far south are some of the brown race known as the malays who are more like our filipinos and in the central part of the country are the pure siamese all of these peoples take life more easily than those we have seen in japan and china they work less and live largely from hand to mouth this is due somewhat to the rich soil and tropical climate which supply most of their wants the weather is such that but little clothing is needed and no fuel is used except for cooking the streams have fish which are easily caught and the bananas coconuts and mangoes grow without much cultivation most of the houses are rude huts of cane and palm leaves and so man has little incentive to work the siamese are a proud people they are fond of jewelry and of all sorts of display they consider themselves born gentlemen and show it in their manners they are clever but not so energetic as the people of northern asia where the climate is cold as it is most of the business is done by the chinese who have come here in great numbers the chinese have little stores in the villages and do the skilled mechanical work of the cities there are altogether one million of them in siam and they form about one-third of the population of bangkok siam has great natural resources its moist tropical climate heavy rainfall and rich soil fit it for rice and it raises so much of that grain every year that it could give each man woman and child upon earth a pound and have some to spare it produces pepper and spices coffee tobacco and cotton it is setting out plantations of rubber and we shall have an abundance of bananas oranges and mangoes during our travels the forests are especially valuable siam has more teakwood perhaps than any other country and hundreds of elephants are employed in dragging teak logs to the streams and in aiding the men at the sawmills teak is a very hard wood containing so much oil that it does not rot when in water it is used in shipbuilding wagon making and furniture making and also in machinery in connection with iron and steel it is worth so much that thousands of tons of it in the shape of great rafts are annually floated down to bangkok and exported thence to all parts of the world siam is rich in minerals it has gold iron and zinc and in its southern portions are large deposits of tin it also has beautiful rubies and sapphires as we sail up the minam river in our steamer from saigon we see many floating houses the river is wide and its banks are lined with the tropical jungle there are coconut and other palms 
whose leaves wave to and fro in the breeze and below them are trees out of which monkeys chatter at us as we go by one species of monkey has long gray silken hair it is a little fellow and its voice is like the cry of a baby we see also parrots and other birds of gay plumage and in one place what at first seems a black log turns to an alligator which crawls down the bank and dives into the stream after forty miles ride we approach bangkok it is a great city lying on both sides of the minam and reaching far back into the country we can see the spires of its temples above the green trees long before we come to it there are suburbs consisting of canals running back from the river with houses floating upon them making each canal look like a street as we come nearer the city the floating houses increase until at last we find thousands of them on each side of us on the wide minam river what queer-looking dwellings they are we can see them plainly as we stand on the deck of the steamer they are built upon rafts so fastened to piles that the houses move up and down with the rise and fall of the tide which is great at this short distance from the gulf of siam the ordinary house is ten or fifteen feet square although many are longer and wider it has a ridge roof and in some dwellings the roof is made in two ridges so that the end looks like a gigantic w turned upside down many of these floating houses have verandas in front of them where the people sit on the floor and where the half-naked little ones play about within a few feet of drowning most of the houses are of but one story and but few of them have more than three or four rooms we can see in as we pass there is hardly any furniture and we look in vain for sofas or beds the people sit on their heels and sleep on the floor as for pillows they use wooden blocks or bundles of stuffed cotton of the size of a brick and almost as hard the cooking is done upon charcoal which is burned in boxes half filled with ashes the houses have no chimneys and the gas from the coal gets out as it can the windows are open holes in the walls and probably there is not a pane of window glass in the whole floating city we land at the wharves and find comfortable quarters in a hotel on the mainland it is on the mainland that the greater part of bangkok is located it runs for ten miles up and down both sides of the river extending far back into the country it has more than one hundred miles of carriage roads and several wide streets upon which electric cars go there are some modern buildings rice mills and factories and also temples fine residences and great palaces surrounded by walls the city is like venice in that it is cut up by canals and we cross many bridges as we drive through street after street we are most interested however in the houses afloat and we hire sampans and spend the day riding among them more than one hundred thousand people in bangkok have their homes on the water and spend the greater part of their lives in such homes now and then we see a house being moved from one place to another we are told that each pays a rent for its place on the river and that when its owner becomes dissatisfied he does not need to call in a cart or dray to carry his furniture to another location all that he does is to untie his house from the posts to which it is fastened and hire a boat to tow it up or down stream we find the minam full of craft of all kinds including numerous small boats containing peddlers and shoppers many of the floating houses are stores and a child is often sent in his canoe to buy the supplies of the family we are surprised at the number of boats the river is filled with them and some of the smaller ones are managed by children every family has its canoes and the boys often have canoes of their own we see little fellows rowing boats not more than two feet in width and so long and narrow that the least loss of balance would turn them into the water most of the boys are naked except for a breech cloth and all have learned to swim like so many ducks we observe that much of the river craft is managed by women some row from house to house carrying vegetables rice and trinkets for sale there are freight boats sculled by half-naked women who stand up as they push on the oars and boats carrying merchandise worked by wrinkled old women of sixty the men do but little they loaf smoke and gossip 
while their wives earn the money required for the family is not this a strange city stop a moment and look at the people they are a short stocky race with yellow skins thick lips and rather flat noses their eyes are almost as slanting as those of the chinese but their features are different their hair is jet black although the aged men and women often have hair white as snow both men and women wear the hair short and it stands straight up like so many bristles all over the head how little clothing they have it is so hot we wish we could dress in the same way for the hot moist air makes us perspire some of the boys and girls are half naked and those under ten years of age have only a piece of twine around the waist to this small charms are fastened to keep off the witches and spirits the little ones believe in such things and would as soon think of leaving off their charms as we would of going out of doors without shirts or trousers even the children of rich people go almost naked i remember once attending a great celebration where i saw a siamese prince of six years strutting about he was clad only in a belt of woven silver about an inch wide and a ring of gold on each of his angles the siamese men of the poorer classes are usually naked to the waist their sole garment being a strip of cotton cloth a yard wide and two yards in length this is wound about the body over the hips one end being pulled from behind through the legs and fastened with a twist at the waist others add a strip of cloth which they throw over their shoulders the rich often wear jackets of cotton or silk in addition to the sarong above described the latter taking the place of our pantaloons the siamese women clothe the lower part of the body in much the same way but they usually add a wide band of cloth which they wrap around the body under the arms and fasten in a knot over the chest the babies of all classes wear nothing at all excepting perhaps the yellow powder which their mothers dust over them to keep off the flies and mosquitoes End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the king of siam and his government buddhism it was not long ago that all the people of siam were the slaves of the king they had to work a part of the year for him without pay and he could command any woman or girl to serve in his palaces he had power of life and death over his subjects and when they came into his presence they crawled upon their hands and knees bumping their heads on the ground to show their subjection these customs are now done away with and siam is fast becoming one of the progressive nations of asia the king long ago began to rule by means of a cabinet made up chiefly of his nearest relatives and he is also a council of forty members who make the laws of the kingdom he is still an absolute ruler but every year the people are being granted more part in the government and in time they may rule themselves the country is divided into eighteen provinces each under a governor appointed by the king every province has its own courts and schools and at bangkok is a supreme court and other government institutions the chief schools are there including seminaries for girls and colleges of various kinds it is in bangkok that the king lives his palaces are on the banks of the minam they cover many acres and are surrounded by walls several miles long the king dwells inside the walls with his wives and the buildings devoted to the women are never entered by any other man they are under the charge of the queen who by law is the king's half-sister and must be his chief wife although he may have several hundred other secondary wives all the ladies of the palace have short hair and they are usually clad in the ordinary siamese dress to which they may add a silk jacket and scarf but we are told that we can visit some of the palaces we pass the soldiers who guard the gates and go up a wide drive lined with trees and flowers to an immense building of brick and stone covered with stucco it is painted white and under the bright rays of the siamese sun it appears to be marble it has several stories 
and wide marble stairways lead up to a great front door the stairways are guarded on each side at the bottom by elephants of iron plated with gold we walk between these elephants pass up the steps and soon find ourselves in the state reception room one of the most splendid rooms of the world its walls are frescoed with gold its ceiling is of pieces of glass of all colors which with the light shining through them look almost like jewels at the back of the room is the king's throne with the state umbrellas decorated with silver and gold standing beside it these umbrellas are held over his majesty when he receives his subjects all around placed against the wall and half filling the room are trees and bushes of the precious metals their leaves are of solid gold and silver and the trunks are of wood or iron plated with these metals the workmanship is as beautiful as that of the most skilful jewelers of europe these trees are among the offerings made every year to the king by his officials and the rulers of his tributary provinces leaving the palace we call upon the cabinet ministers they tell us siam is rapidly improving in civilization and wealth the king is introducing railroads and telegraphs he has established post offices everywhere and we can send letters home for five cents the minister of agriculture says that the chief crop of siam is rice it is the national food as well as the principal article of export the money received every year from that sent abroad now amounts to almost thirty million dollars and new rice lands are being brought under irrigation later on we visit the rice mills of which there are many in bangkok they are operated by steam and are equipped with modern machinery one of our most interesting excursions is to the palace stables to see the white elephants siam is called the land of the white elephant there is a picture of an elephant on the national flag and it is also stamped on the coins when the king and princes ride out in state it is upon elephants and the people seem to honor the elephants quite as much as the king the reason for this we find in buddhism which is the religion of the siamese they believe that the souls of men at their deaths enter the bodies of animals and that every animal has the soul of some person in it moreover the souls of the good go into white animals and those of kings saints and heroes are supposed to be born again as white elephants these animals are therefore royal beasts and are worshipped as containing the spirits of great men the siamese have always treated them with honor and until some years ago they gave every white elephant a special attendant they covered his skin with velvet cloths and bound his ivory tusks with golden bands from time to time shows and concerts were given in honor of such animals and golden chains were hung around their necks we have heard many such stories and are all agog to see the white elephants what do we find nothing but wild-eyed scraggy-looking beasts with long tusks and skins not much whiter than those of the elephants we see in the circus the only parts really white are the long flapping ears the remainder of the body being ash-colored in spots later on we go to the museum and ask the scientists where the white elephants come from they tell us there is no such thing as a healthy white elephant and that these beasts are really sick elephants their whiteness being caused by a disease of the skin and not by the spirit of any great hero as the common people suppose as we look at the elephants we doubt whether his majesty himself now believes that they have royal blood the animals are kept in dirty stables chained by their feet to rough wooden posts and cared for by men who evidently hold them in little respect as we watch the huge beasts the chief keeper holds his hand out to us for a present we give him a few coins and he thereupon makes one of the royal white elephants kneel down and salute us by raising its trunk it makes us feel grand we go from the elephant stables to the temples to learn more about the buddhist religion of which we see much in our tour through this part of the world buddhism was founded by a prince named siddhartha who was born in northern india in the sixth century before christ and was brought up in luxury and splendor 
it was not until he reached manhood and came forth from his palaces that he knew of the poverty trouble and evil which existed in the world he was then overcome with sorrow by the woes and wants of mankind and decided to go forth and learn how to relieve them he started out as a beggar and spent his life in the search after a time he thought he had discovered the way and then went about preaching it he called himself buddha which means the enlightened the religion he taught many considered the true one and in time it came to be called the buddhist religion it has lasted in one shape or other from then on throughout the ages until now and it is still believed by millions of people we have seen buddhists in japan korea and china there are a large number in java and malaysia and a great many in burma and india the religion has changed greatly since it was first taught and it now contains many strange beliefs in most places it is but little better than a worship of idols carried on with the aid of lazy ignorant priests there are more than ten thousand priests in the city of bangkok and we meet them everywhere as we go through the city they wear their heads shaved and have strips of yellow cloth wound about their half-naked bodies they are far from humble and strut along smoking cigars and chewing the beetle as they walk from door to door begging for rice we spend several days in visiting the temples they are gorgeous beyond description and some cover acres having gold-plated spires taller than the tallest of palm trees the temple in which the king worships has a spire that cost one hundred thousand dollars to gild and its doors are of ebony inlaid with mother-of-pearl its chief room has a carpet of silver wires woven together this temple contains an idol a foot high and eight inches wide which is all pure gold and jewels when the metal was still liquid in the melting pot sapphires rubies and diamonds were stirred into it and the mixture was cast into this little god it is before it that the king comes to pray and there the ladies of his palace bow down at certain times of the year the idol is on a pedestal or shelf high above the floor of the temple it has a little silk scarf about its neck and this is changed every season. End of chapter 26。Chapter 27 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Singapore and the Malays. Leaving Bangkok, we sail for five days to the southward over the gulf of siam to the straits of malacca and land at singapore within eighty miles of the equator our voyage is through summer seas and the surroundings are those of the tropics all nature is changed at night the stars seem more brilliant than we have ever seen them before and venus and mars cast rays like those of the moon upon the water the moon itself appears closer to the earth and larger and brighter than it was in america we see the southern cross the stars of which are not visible from our part of the world the milky way seems more milky than ever the sea is bluer and the phosphorus upon the water marks out the ship's track as a wide road of fire which loses itself now and then in the darkness but springs alive again upon every wavelet sent out from the steamer the sun so hot at midday that we dare not step out upon the deck without some sort of head covering goes down in the west in a gorgeous splendor unknown to our land its dying rays color the water with bright tints of gold which fade one into another and finally when the sun has sunk below the horizon change to a delicate purple and then to a rich dark blue only to light up again under the bright tropical splendor of the moon and stars when there are clouds in the sky the sunsets are grander as we near the coast and float into the straits the sun's last rays are filtered through palm trees and the funeral song of the dying day is sung by a thousand birds whose voices are new to the ears of the people of the temperate zone we float along the malay peninsula which though it is near the main line of ocean travel is but little known to the world it is in the heart of the tropics 
its rich soil being covered with a dense jungle of luxuriant vegetation and its shores bordered with coconut palms this part of indochina has also forests of the choicest hardwoods we are now coasting the land of the malays the home of the tiger the malay peninsula has jungles filled with wild beasts hundreds of which swim across the narrow strait between the peninsula and the island of singapore every year tigers prowl about the villages of the mainland and even visit the cities i was once shown the tracks of a tiger in the heart of the capital of the state of johor they were plainly outlined in the sawdust of a lumber mill and were so fresh that they must have been made only a few hours before the tiger had run through the mill at night without attacking the then quiet buzz saw or molesting the babies and children who were sleeping quietly in the thatched huts hard by the danger of tigers and snakes is so great that the government offers rewards for killing them the usual fee for a tiger is fifty dollars and that for a snake ranges from fifty cents to five dollars according to size and kind i once saw a man bring from the jungle into singapore thirty-nine venomous snakes for each of which he demanded a reward he carried them in a bag and when he showed them to the policeman he put in his hand and pulled the snakes out one by one and killed them by cracking their heads against the ground his hands were bare but he did not seem to be afraid of the snakes why he was not bitten i do not know the greater part of the malay peninsula and also the small islands of singapore and penang which lie at its southern end in the straits of malacca belong to great britain the mainland yields coffee rubber and spices and its mines produce most of the tin used by the world the islands are valuable as trading centers and this is especially so of singapore which is often called the halfway station on the trip around the world from africa to europe and from europe to china and japan the great ships which trade with the far east by way of the suez canal stop here on their way through the straits of malacca and there are also steamers which call as they go to or come from australia and the islands of the dutch east indies our naval vessels and transports sailing from europe to the philippine islands call at singapore and it has ships almost every day from ceylon hindustan and burma the trade is so great that a fine seaport known as singapore city has grown up about the chief harbor whereas our ship comes to anchor we are surrounded by vessels from all parts of the world landing we are met by a medley of people from the countries about those we see on the wharves are of every shade of black yellow and brown there are malays the brown-skinned natives of the mainland and the islands there are siamese in sarongs jackets and caps and yellow burmese dressed in silks with silk handkerchiefs wrapped around their heads there are chinese rich and poor some clad in silk and some in blue cotton and clings from india as black as coal and as straight as pine trees it is the chinese and east indians who do most of the work the latter driving the bullock carts from wharf to wharf and handling the freight there are dyaks from borneo arabs from about the red sea and persians in white caps and gowns there are tall sikh policemen from india with high turbans of red parsees from bombay with hats like inverted coal scuttles and also many whites made up of english french germans and americans who are passing through or are engaged here in trade the city altogether has several hundred thousand inhabitants of whom almost all are from asia or the islands nearby there are more chinese than any of the others and we shall find that the chinese do most of the business leaving the wharves we go to our hotel which is situated in a beautiful park not far from the sea there are tennis courts and golf grounds and not far away is the botanical garden one of the finest of the world during our stay we call upon the governor and at his suggestion cross to the mainland and go by railroad through the states of malaysia the trip is delightful we are in the tropics and our way is through plantations of bananas coffee and spices 
we spend some time in the orchards learning how nutmegs and cloves are raised and watch the men at work in the vineyards from which come our white and black pepper pepper vines grow much like hops they are trained upon tree stumps or upon sticks set upright in the ground they begin to bear in the third year after planting and a single one will often produce as much as two pounds of pepper per annum some of them yield two crops every year and they continue to do this for many years there is no difference between the berries which produce the black pepper and white pepper both are from the same kind of berry and from the same vine the black pepper comes from the berries picked when green as they dry they turn black the white pepper comes from those which are left on the vines until ripe and which when picked are of a fiery red color the berries are soaked in water when the outer skin falls off and leaves the pepper of commerce we go to the tin mines which are situated on the malay peninsula and also in the islands of banca and billiton near by the tin is often in the form of grains mixed with earth and it is washed out as our miners wash gold from the placer deposits of the rockies some tin is found in the streams and some far below ground the latter being carried up by chinese who climb ladders with baskets of tin ore on their backs after the ore is cleaned it is smelted in charcoal furnaces being run off into bricks of about the size of a five-cent loaf of bread it now looks like silver and is ready to be shipped to the markets we meet many malays at singapore and find them everywhere during our travels through the malay peninsula they are the aborigines or native inhabitants of this part of asia they are a peculiar people in color and features not unlike our filipinos they have brown skins straight well-made forms and small hands and feet on the peninsula the poorer classes wear but little clothing the smaller children go almost naked and the men wear a bag-like skirt which reaches from the waist to below the knees when a malay puts on his clothes he places this skirt on the floor and steps into it he then lifts it up to his waist and fastens it there in a knot the dress of the women covers the whole of the body and the richer ones have light silk shawls on their heads the well-to-do men wear jackets and caps but the poor are often bare to the waist the men are proud and haughty they stand straight and their walk is quite graceful we see very few of the high-class malay women these people are mohammedans and they keep their wives and daughters secluded this is one of the customs of their religion of which we shall learn more farther on in our travels the malay villages are made up of one-story huts thatched with palm leaves the houses are seldom more than fifteen feet square they contain but little furniture the kitchen utensils consisting of a few pots an iron pan and a coconut ladle the family sit on their heels or sprawl at full length when taking their ease in their homes the only beds are mats spread upon the earth floor every one smokes and nearly all chew the beetle the climate here is such that one needs but little clothing babies and small children often wear nothing at all and we find it best to take off everything possible we are now near the equator where the sun rises and sets at the same hour each day the year through where the flowers always bloom and the trees are always green birds by the thousands sing all the year round and the temperatures from one year's end to the other is that of a moist july in our rides over the peninsula and upon the islands we pass through tropical jungles and now and then see coffee plantations and coconut groves the green coconuts hang in great bunches from the tops of palm trees each of which is from fifty to one hundred feet high now and then a nut falls and we cut out a hole in the end and drink the sweet milk the coffee estates are made up of fields of green bushes which if not trimmed grow to a height of eighteen feet the bushes have berries which when ripe are dark red and of about the size of a cherry they look much like cherries save that they grow close to the branches and not upon stems each berry contains two seeds surrounded by pulp and these seeds are the beans or coffee of commerce the malays we see at singapore are lazy 
and we learn that they live from hand to mouth working only enough to keep them from starving in the interior they are more industrious and not a few of them are now setting out plantations of coffee cacao pepper and rubber the country has greatly improved since the british took it under their protection they have established justice and order and are starting schools everywhere they have post offices and postal savings banks they are building railroads and laying out towns we find hotels at the capitals and stop at the government rest houses in the villages each state is ruled by a native sultan but the sultan has british officials to help him and the country is increasing in wealth end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in british burma think of a nation whose women wear plugs in the lobes of their ears as thick as your finger and whose men often have their bodies tattooed from the waist to the knees let these people have olive-brown complexions eyes almost straight fat noses and lips a little thicker than ours let both sexes have long black hair which they bind up in a knot on the tops of their heads let the men wear turbans of bright red or yellow and the rest of their clothing consist of a white linen or cotton jacket reaching to the waist and a gay-colored silk or cotton skirt that falls to the feet being bound tightly about the legs and loins and tied in front at the waist let the women dress in much the same way except that their heads have no covering let all go barefooted and you have some idea of the people of burma among whom we find ourselves after sailing along the east coast of the bay of bengal and up the mighty irrawaddy river to the city of rangoon burma is more than twice the size of great britain and ireland it is three times as big as kansas and far larger than germany in europe it is a rich country much of it being covered with a vegetation so dense that nothing but an elephant can force its way through it is a land of great mountains of many hills and of low valleys cut up by rivers which feed some of the richest rice fields of the world the chief river is the irrawaddy in whose mouth we now are this rises in the himalayas and flows in a long winding course through gorges and hills it then enters a broad valley and finally empties into the bay of bengal the irrawaddy has a great volume it is loaded with silt or earth washings and these have built up much of the country for hours before we come in sight of land we find the water of the bay of bengal discolored by them and are told that the river has had much to do with enriching the country another mighty stream is the salwin which rises in the mountains of tibet north of lhasa and flows with many rapids down to the sea while a third is the mekong which runs along the eastern side of burma and then separating siam from french indochina flows out through cochin china into the pacific ocean we have already seen the mekong during our travels all these rivers are more or less navigable and the irrawaddy forms a great water highway up which steamers can go quite as far as the distance from new orleans to chicago the mountains of burma contain rich deposits of gold silver and copper they have mines of jade and the country produces the most beautiful rubies to be found anywhere the land is well populated it has many thatched villages and several large cities in the chief seaport and capital rangoon where we are now there are over a quarter of a million inhabitants and a night's ride by train will take us up the irrawaddy to mandalay which has almost two hundred thousand the population of the whole of burma is more than eleven millions this country situated away out here on the other side of the world belongs to great britain it is a part of the east indian empire which is ruled by a viceroy appointed by the king and by lieutenant governors one of whom has charge of each large east indian province rangoon is the capital of the province of burma and here the lieutenant governor and his chief officials live the city has fine public buildings and beautiful residences most of which are the homes of the british 
it has great banks wide streets and beautiful stores we call at the secretariat a large stone structure on the main street and find it swarming with clerks and other officials from whom we learn much concerning the country and people they tell us that burma was for a long time governed by kings who oppressed their subjects and tortured and killed them at will after the british took possession of the country this was done away with the laws were changed courts were established and now every one has almost as much liberty as we have at home several railroads have been built and others are planned which will sometime enable one to go from here to china by rail we find many burmese among the clerks in the secretariat and we learn that the people are intelligent and that they have their own language and literature they are far better educated than the malays and siamese nearly every man knows how to read and write and every burmese boy is expected to go to school the native schools are often held in the buddhist monasteries and the priests are the teachers while in such schools the pupils sit on the floor and study aloud shouting the lessons they are trying to learn the teachers who are sober-faced men with shaved heads dressed in long gowns walk up and down the room with whips in their hands keeping their eyes on the pupils and the boy who stops shouting is liable to get a cut of the whip the studies are largely the precepts of the buddhist religion and many of the boys become priests after leaving school in addition to these native schools the british government has established some like those we have at home there are now more than six thousand schools in operation with several hundred thousand pupils on the rolls in them the children have the same studies as ours but the books are in burmese instead of english the boys are interested in athletics and they play football and cricket there are also girls schools run by the government although all the natives do not approve of them in the past these people did not think that women should be educated and according to their religion women were not of much account in comparison with men the burmese are buddhists we shall see temples and monasteries wherever we go and shall frequently meet bareheaded monks clad in yellow robes walking about with begging bowls in their hands the whole country is dotted with pagodas and there are monasteries everywhere according to their religion every man or boy must become a monk before his soul can be born and for this reason a boy is supposed to enter a monastery for a time before he thinks of becoming a man while he is in the monastery he lays aside his good clothes and dresses in a single sheet of rough yellow cotton he now works in the monastery and goes forth to beg he is supported by the gifts of the people and no matter how rich his family is he lives on the rice and other things which are given to him in the way of charity the boy at first acts as a servant or chila much as did kim in rudyard kipling's delightful story of that name and later on he is given more important duties while in the monastery he is taught the principles of the buddha's faith and is urged to spend his life doing good after a time he may leave the priesthood and go back to his home or he may remain and devote his life to the service of his religion these people spend a great deal of money on religion and charity they give much to the church and we shall find rest houses and drinking places for travellers all over burma we shall see great temples and numerous pagodas erected in honour of buddha some of which are wonderfully grand suppose we pay a visit to the golden pagoda at rangoon it stands upon the side of a temple which was erected here more than five hundred years before christ was born it is a great gilded tower rising in mighty rings from an immense stone platform and growing smaller as it goes upward until it ends at last in a golden spire which seems to almost pierce the sky it is higher than any stone structure in america except the monument at washington and the whole of it blazes in the sunlight as though it were solid gold upon its top is the golden umbrella which is studded with jewels the tower is made of brick and mortar and only its outside is plated with gold it has been regilded again and again and there is an enormous amount of the precious metal in it during the last century one of the kings of burma vowed that he would give his own weight in gold to this pagoda 
the vow cost him forty five thousand dollars worth of gold leaf for it took just that much it is said to equal his weight the burmese tell us that the golden pagoda is built above a casket containing eight hairs from the head of buddha himself and it is this fact that makes the place holy about the golden pagoda we see dozens of women clad in bright silk gowns and white silk jackets kneeling and praying upon the platform are offerings of rice and flowers and the air is filled with the perfume of the roses which worshippers have laid at its base men are bowing before it and as we look boys come up kneel down hold up their hands and pray under the blazing sun we can see that they believe in their religion and in our travels shall find that many of them are good boys and girls and good men and women they do the best they can with the light they have and some are now learning about christianity and coming to believe as we do End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b with the burmese at home we shall go out into the country this morning and see something of the burmese at home the people live largely in villages each town being ruled by its headmen or elders who are appointed by the government with the consent of the people the houses are small and in most places are little more than sheds set upon piles they have walls of plaited or woven bamboo and the roofs are of palm leaves pinned or sewn to rafters of cane very few of them have more than one story and they are usually built upon a platform so high above the ground that one can walk under it without stooping the cattle are sometimes kept in the space under the house and one has to climb a ladder or steps to reach the first floor the people have but little furniture they sit eat and sleep on the floor so that chairs tables and beds are not needed they sometimes use sleeping mats and rest their heads upon pillows or rather pillow frames of cane each being of about the size and shape of a small loaf of bread every house has a little plot of land at the back which contains some fruit trees vegetables and flowers at the front it faces the street which is usually lined with trees bearing tropical fruits along the roadsides near the villages are shade trees with platforms below them where travellers may rest or the village headmen discuss local affairs much of the cooking is done out of doors the fire is built upon the ground and the cooking utensils consist of little more than two or three earthen pots the chief food is rice a huge platter of it being served at each meal in addition there is a bowl of curry a gravy-like mixture made of fish and so seasoned with pepper that it is exceedingly hot there are also other hot relishes and among them a bad-smelling fish paste made by burying raw fish in the sea sand until it is rotten in eating the rice dish is placed on the floor and the family squat about it each member having two bowls a small one for curry and a large one for rice there are no knives nor forks every one helps himself putting his fingers into his rice bowl and taking up all he can squeeze in his mouth and then crowding it into his mouth at the close of the meal each member is required to wash his own dishes no drinking is done during meals but at the end each goes to the water jar to rinse out his mouth all take a smoke after eating the grandfather and grandmother parents and children puffing together sometimes one cigar suffices for the whole family the members passing it from one to another and smoking by turns we are delighted with the burmese they are kind and polite and make us at home the boys are full of fun and show us their games the girls are more free to talk with us than any others of their sex we have met with in asia they are intelligent and we learn that the women have more rights than any other women upon earth outside those of the united states or europe they have equal rights and property with their husbands and they generally carry the family purse a large part of the business of burma is done by the women the native stores are collected together in bazaars each consisting of a large number of little shops 
under one roof these shops are small rooms opening upon the streets or passages which run through the bazaar each room is walled with goods and its woman merchant sits on the floor as she shows her wares to the purchaser who stands in the passage and bargains as to the price he will pay they sell silks cottons cigars jewelry and many other articles very few of them can read or write but all are able to count quickly and they understand how to bargain girls often go into the bazaars and remain there selling goods until they get husbands in burma love-making is carried on in somewhat the same way as with us and the burmese husband as a rule has but one wife although more are permitted parents usually arrange marriages without asking the consent of their son or daughter who is to be married but elopements are common and engagements are sometimes made by the young people themselves the marriage consists of the eating together of rice out of one bowl in the presence of friends and of promising before them to live together henceforth as man and wife the burmese believe that women should marry as will be seen from one of their proverbs which reads as follows monks are beautiful when they are lean four-footed animals when they are fat men when they are learned and women when they are married as we go on with our travels through burma we find that the people have many curious customs for instance nearly every boy has his legs tattooed from the waist to the knees and he looks upon this coat of tattooing as a sign of manhood gladly submitting to the pain he must undergo to secure it the work is done by a professional tattooer who uses a steel pricker which has at its end four split points as sharp as needles these points are dipped into ink and then thrust into the skin carrying the ink under the surface the tattooer takes up the skin in his hand and pinches it while he thus pierces it with the inked needles which are to discolor it forever in this way he makes pictures all over the boy's thighs so that when the tattooing is completed he looks as though he were dressed in kid tights covered with red and blue figures of serpents tigers ogres and demons such tattooing is not done all at once but figure by figure as the boy can stand the pain it takes some years before one can get a full coat the burmese are superstitious and they believe that certain tattooed figures will ward off diseases one for instance is a protection from snake bites and another will keep one from drowning a third figure is especially prized by the schoolboy for it prevents so they tell us his feeling the whip when punished we are also struck by the plugs of gold silver or glass which the girls wear in their ears and which they prize quite as much as the boys do their coats of tattooing a girl is not considered a woman until after her ears have been pierced and she is as anxious to have her first ear plugs as our girls are to have their first long dresses this is so notwithstanding the pain that comes from making and enlarging the holes the work begins when the girl has reached the age of twelve or thirteen which occasion is celebrated by a feast to which all the friends and relatives are invited when the party has assembled the girl lies down on a mat and a professional ear borer thrusts a gold needle through the lobe of each of her ears twisting it around so that it forms a ring which is left in the ear as the needle goes through the girl screams with pain but her cries are drowned by the music of a band which plays outside the house it takes the ear some time to heal and then the process of making the holes larger begins the needle is now taken out and a fine gold plate tightly rolled up is inserted this plate is gradually opened from week to week until the hole has been stretched to the size of your little finger or larger the poor who cannot afford gold use silver needles for piercing and stems of grass for enlarging the lobes inserting one stem after another until they have a bunch of grass as big around as your thumb in each ear after a long time when the holes have become of the proper size the ear plugs or hollow pieces of gold or some cheaper material are put in the plugs being as costly as the girl can afford some are set with jewels some are of glass and others of amber the holes thus made are so large that a man could easily put his thumb through them and a common sight is a woman 
carrying a big cigar in her ear end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the working elephants in burma one of the great sights of burma is the elephants at work elephants at work i hear someone ask what do you mean do these great clumsy beasts actually do anything except carry men on their backs yes indeed but they are not clumsy they are among the most intelligent animals of the world let us visit the lumber yards at rangoon there we shall find these beasts carrying great logs they move piles of lumber and they obey the orders of their masters almost as though they were men and could understand what is said there is one carrying a teak log on his tusks the elephant has thrown his trunk over the top of the log and he balances his long heavy burden in the air as he moves slowly onward picking his way in and out through the piles of lumber his master is a dark-skinned half-naked man dressed in a white waistcloth and jacket and with a red handkerchief tied about his black head he sits on the animal's neck just back of the great flapping ears with his bare legs hanging down on each side he speaks to the elephant now and then and when it does not obey he thrusts into its skin the point of a short brass hook fastened to the end of the stick which he has in his hand we follow the elephant to see what he will do with the log he carries it to the sawmill on the opposite side of the yard where is a truck upon wheels so placed that the logs upon it can be moved against the circular saw by which they are to be divided into boards the elephant takes his log to this truck he lays it lengthwise upon the truck and with his tusks and trunk moves it into just the proper place for the saw there is another elephant piling logs he has laid the logs regularly one on top of another as evenly as though he had calculated their order by measure see how he raises that log in order to carry it to the pile he goes to the centre of the log and gets down on his knees before it next he thrusts his tusks under it and then throwing his trunk over the top rises slowly upward with his heavy burden nicely balanced and thus takes it to the pile at first he can roll the log upon the pile without trouble but as this becomes higher he has to lift the log to the top to accomplish this he stands it upon end propping it against the pile then placing his tusks under the lower end of the log he slides it up off the ground and with a kick sends it flying into its place there goes a bell it is noon and that is the signal for the men in the yard to stop work for dinner we find that the elephants stop too they do not wait for orders from their drivers but at the sound of the bell first falls on their ears they drop their loads and bolt for the feeding shed their drivers tell us that they cannot make the animals work after the bell has been rung they say also that a working elephant must be fed regularly and have his bath twice a day he becomes restless if anything gets under the cloth upon his back and will tremble like a woman at the sight of a mouse for fear that the little animal may run up his trunk at one of the yards i see the men washing the beasts the elephants sat down while buckets of water were thrown over them and their masters scrubbed them with rough brushes as the water was dashed upon them they wagged their tails flapped their ears and grunted in joy as we leave the lumber yards we throw some silver to the rider of one of the elephants the man catches it he speaks to his elephant and the great beast throws its trunk high up in the air and gives us a salute as though he knew that we had been kind to his master elephants are used in clearing the teak forests and in getting the timber out to the streams they not only carry the logs to the rivers but aid in shoving them about in the water they wade or swim according as the river is shallow or deep and tow the logs this way and that when the rafts have reached port or are piled up they break the booms by pushing out the key log and they will take the timbers from the river and load them on the cars which are to carry them to the mills in some places where the elephants labor together there are boss elephants which keep the other beasts up to their work 
pounding them with their trunks when they lag in the lumber yards each elephant has his own peculiar job one carrying the hay for the stables and aiding in mixing the bran molasses and other food which form the rations of the elephants these huge beasts are used also for farming they drag the heavy ploughs which break up the matted soil of the jungle and aid in turning it into farms the elephant plough is a two-wheeled instrument with a heavy share fastened to it one man holds the handles of the plough and presses the share into the earth another sits on the neck of the elephant and a third walking by his side aids in directing the huge animal along the furrow travelling in upper burma is done upon elephants they are the only beasts by which we can make our way through the jungle they can pull the branches aside with their tusks and push their way through the thickest of the tropical vegetation they can swim rivers and climb hills and it is said that when they come to very steep places they sometimes sit down on their hind legs and slide down in preference to risking a fall by walking end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b industrial burma rice we are on the irrawaddy river this morning we have taken the steamer and are travelling northward through the interior of burma our accommodations are good and as we sit on the deck we can see the rich lands on both sides of the river we ride for miles through broad fields of rice this is the great crop of the country the people depend upon the rice crop and they are prosperous or the reverse as the rice grows well or ill it brings in more money than anything else the annual exports amounting to thousands of millions of pounds indeed burma sells enough rice every year to give every man woman and child upon earth all he could eat in one day and still leave hundreds of millions of pounds the valley of the irrawaddy is largely made up of rice lands we see men here and there ploughing they drive water buffaloes through the mud turning the soil with ploughs of wood in some places the ploughs hardly scratch the soil and in others the children are driving buffaloes and oxen over the wetlands which are thus broken up by their hoofs a little later logs and brush will be dragged over the ground to smooth it in other places the farming is more carefully done for the british are teaching the natives how to get more out of their lands in growing rice the seed is sown broadcast or in nurseries from which the young plants are afterwards taken and set out in regular rows this is done by the women and children the lazy men usually sitting on the edge of the fields and watching them work the transplanting takes place about a month after sowing at which time the plants have grown a foot high they are now pulled up and carried on poles in bundles of about a thousand each to the fields the women make a hole in the earth with their fingers and thrust down a tuft of three or four plants in it and then squeeze the earth tight around it these tufts are set about a foot apart and there are about forty five thousand of them to one acre the rice crop must have plenty of water in some parts of the country the rains are sufficient but in others the lands are irrigated the fields being flooded from time to time as the grain matures the water is taken off the rice soon turns from green to yellow and each field looks not unlike one of ripe wheat or oats the rice is harvested with sickles but little more than the heads being cut off it is partially threshed by laying it on a hard piece of ground and driving bullocks over it after that it is taken to the rivers and shipped to rangoon or other ports from where it is sent to all parts of the world a grain of rice when it leaves the farmer is much like a grain of wheat with the husk on this husk must be taken off before the rice can be used and burma has great steam mills for this purpose which employ thousands of men they are not unlike the huge flouring mills of america suppose we visit one of the mills and see how rice cleaning is done there are some very large ones on the edge of rangoon the grain comes down in boats and is carried in baskets on the backs and shoulders 
of girls up to the mills here it is passed through one pair of millstones after another each pair tears off a bit of the husk until at last we have the white grains which we use for eating after the husk is removed the rice must be smoothed up for the market it is strange to think of polishing grain as we polish silver spoons but that is what is done with rice the husked grains are thrown by machinery against rollers covered with sheepskin as soft as the inside of a kid glove they are brought into contact with these rollers again and again until they are as white as freshly slaked lime and perfectly smooth as we go on our way up the river we now and then pass small cotton plantations and here and there find the people rearing the silkworms from which come the beautiful silks so commonly worn by the burmese we stop at the oil fields which are now producing a great deal of petroleum and then make an excursion to the moguk valley about ninety miles from mandalay from whence come the most beautiful rubies known to the world a fine ruby is even more valuable than a diamond of the same weight it has been estimated that one of the color of pigeon's blood weighing five carats will sell for several times as much as a five carat diamond and that the proportionate price of the ruby will increase with its size a ruby which weighed eleven carats was recently sold in london for thirty five thousand dollars whereas a diamond of that size would not bring more than one-fifth that amount rubies are found in a layer of gravel or sand which lies at some distance below the earth's surface the clay is dug away and the gravel is taken out and washed it is then picked over and the rubies are sorted according to their quality and size the best of the stones are sent to london where they are sold to jewelers from all parts of the world going back to the river we proceed northward to bamo a thriving city on the trade route to china we are now not far from the borders of that great country and we could by an easy trip make our way there the scenery on the upper part of the irrawaddy is noted for its magnificence the river is clear and deep and it winds between high cliffs covered with forests in the northern part of the country many strange men and women come down to our steamer they wear but little clothing although they are almost loaded with jewelry of brass and other metals among them are the shans kachins and chins some of them are quite savage and all are less civilized than the burmese a few of the tribes go almost naked and some worship spirits the shans have lighter complexions than the burmese and they are especially noted for their fine coats of tattooing they are muscular well formed and are about an inch taller they wear trousers and jackets and many have blue cotton headdresses the karens another large tribe some of whom are also found in lower burma are more like the chinese although they dress like the burmese they are tattooed and many of the men have the figure of the rising sun pricked in with red ink on the small of their backs many of the karens have been converted to christianity leaving bamo we sail back down the irrawaddy river to mandalay where was the capital of the country before the british conquered burma and changed the seat of government to rangoon mandalay now has about two hundred thousand inhabitants and it is still a place of considerable importance it has large bazaars and hundreds of pagodas in one of which is a bell which weighs ninety tons we spend some time shopping in the city and in making excursions out into the country nearby we do not stay long however we have discovered that farther india is a little world in itself and we long for the still stranger things we are to find in hindustan or east india proper therefore we return to rangoon where we find a ship about to go to calcutta we take passage and are soon far out on the bay of bengal we steam for several days in a northwesterly direction and awake one morning to find ourselves in the muddy waters brought down by the ganges we sail through these into the hoogly river which forms one of the mouths of the ganges and after a few hours come to anchor under the spires and towers of the great city of calcutta end of chapter thirty one
Chapter thirty two of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. General View of India. This morning we begin our travels in East India proper. We are in the great peninsula of Hindustan, a country almost half as large as the United States, and quite as varied in its scenery and character. The land is enormous it extends from the southern part of the asiatic continent in the shape of a great triangle whose base is the himalaya mountains and whose sharp apex lies within a few degrees of the equator if you could lift up hindustan and lay it upon north america with its western end at seattle it would reach as far east as montreal and cape comorin which tips the apex would be wedged into the panama canal from north to south it is as long as the distance from the middle of hudson bay to the gulf of mexico and from east to west it extends as far as the distance from the atlantic ocean to the great salt lake this mighty country is one of extremes the himalayas which border it on the north are the highest mountains on earth their peaks are hidden in perpetual snow and the icy wastes on the top of mount everest kiss the sky at an altitude more than two miles above that of any part of north america except mount mckinley at the foot of the mountains begins a mighty plain which at the east and west is not far above the level of the sea while still farther south the land rises into the mountains and plateaus of the deccan which reach to cape cormoran india is thus composed of mountains and valleys of rolling plateaus and a great lowland plain a country like this must be one of many climates the mountains embrace the temperate and frigid zones while the great plain below is a land of the tropics and in summer is exceedingly hot in general the seasons are three the hot the rainy and cool the hot season lasts through march and april during which time the heat is terrific and no rain falls the rains begin early in may when the southwest monsoon rushes in from the indian ocean they last through the summer and even into october during this season the rains pour and the soil is soaked by them then comes the cool weather which continues throughout the winter or from november to february inclusive in this season it is not cold on the plains but much like our moderate weather in summer the rainfall is varied according to the locality india is one of the wettest lands upon earth and also one of the driest in some provinces the water pours down almost all the time and in others it does not rain for months in succession some places are as dry as the sahara and in others six feet of water has been known to fall in the space of twelve months the land is consequently one of well-watered plains and great deserts it has soils which have been giving rich crops ever since history began to be written and some which the plough of man has never turned india has mighty rivers such as the indus the brahmaputra and the ganges all of which are fed by the perpetual snows of the himalayas these rivers bring down vast loads of silt which feed and enrich the soil of india as egypt is fed and made rich by the nile we shall see how the water is used for irrigation as we travel over the country india is a world as regards its vegetation it has trees and plants of the tropics temperate and frigid zones there are palms in the lowlands and pines cedars and oaks high up in the mountains the country grows all sorts of crops from wheat barley and millet to rice cotton and sugar and it has animals of every climate from the elephants and tigers which roam through the jungles to the wild goats and mountain sheep of the himalayas on the borders of tibet india is also a world in respect to its population it should not be looked upon as one country inhabited by a single race as is the land of china it is more like a continent of many races and many peoples it has altogether more than three hundred million inhabitants or almost one-fifth of the world's population these millions are of several colors some are as black as the africans of the congo and others have skins as fair as our own the east indians speak one hundred and eighty-five languages many of which are as different from the others 
as are the english and russian one of the tongues is spoken by ninety-seven millions another by forty-four millions and there are fourteen other languages each of which is used by more than three millions these many peoples have their own customs and not a few of them their own religions some are worshippers of fire some are buddhists and a vast number are mohammedans millions of them worship spirits and more in number than all the others are the hindus who have many idols representing their ideas of life and death and futurity there are more hindus in india than there are christians in the united states and more mohammedans than in turkey this continent of different races peoples and languages is divided up into many states each of which has its own customs and some of which have a government different from the others the states are all under the rule of great britain although some are still nominally governed by the native princes or rajahs with british advisers to tell them just how to rule is it not strange that a country so great as this should be controlled by the people of a little island kingdom in the north atlantic ocean thousands of miles away yes the possession and administration of india by the english is a wonder of modern government and as we go over the country we shall see that it has been and is of enormous benefit to the east indians but how did the english get the control of this vast territory inhabited by so many millions and lying so far away from their own home the story is an interesting one the work began in the days of queen elizabeth with a contest over a pinch of pepper at that time the dutch of holland controlled the most of the east indian trade they had foreign settlements in hindustan and one of the chief articles which their ships carried home to europe was pepper which then sold for seventy-five cents a pound this gave a large profit to the dutch merchants but they were not satisfied and they doubled the price the english merchants protested that this was too much but the dutch would not make any reduction thereupon the english merchants formed a company to build ships of their own and to send them out to india to bring pepper and other goods to england that was the famous east india company which gradually drove out the dutch and took possession of most of hindustan it was from that company that the british government acquired this great peninsula the chief rulers of the country are now appointed by the king of england who has also the title of the emperor of india at their head is the governor-general or viceroy the word viceroy means vice-king and the governor-general stands here in the place of the king he therefore has great power and has thousands of officials to help him he controls the armies in all the states there are british and native soldiers and among them many who ride upon camels and elephants the soldiers are of a half dozen races coming from such of the nations as are noted for their bravery and military skill they are all under british officers although many subordinate places are held by east indians the british have improved india when they came here hindustan was inhabited by nations which were warring upon each other the taxes were enormous the princes oppressed their subjects and life and property were very unsafe the farming methods were bad and there were frequent famines which killed millions of people there were no public roads to speak of and most of the natives were low in the scale of civilization today we find good order everywhere kept and we can travel as safely through hindustan as in any part of the united states there are good wagon roads everywhere and railroads traverse the most thickly populated parts of the peninsula the people now trade with one another without fear of robbery and they have a vast commerce with other nations at the time the english took control of the country its foreign trade was not more than five million dollars a year it now annually amounts to over five hundred million dollars and it grows more and more as time goes on the extortions of the past have been done away with and the people now pay less taxes than those of any other great land they pay only about one thirteenth as much per head as we do and twenty times less than the people of either france or england the english have given the east indians a good postal and telegraph system we shall be able to mail letters in the smallest villages and as we go over the country 
shall meet postmen going about upon bicycles delivering the mails we can send telegrams at low rates to any part of india and it will not cost very much for us to cable to england or even to new york as we look at the telegraph poles we observe that they are made of iron it seems to us that wood would be cheaper and we ask why this is it is because of the white ant which eats up anything wooden this ant is found in many parts of hindustan and a drove of them would chew up several telegraph poles like those we have in america in one night but suppose we take a few excursions over the country how shall we travel we could use camels or elephants for there are many in hindustan or we might go on the rivers as we did in some of our journeys through china any of these ways would be pleasant for a short time but in the study of a country so large we shall need the most rapid transportation we can possibly get we shall therefore go by the railroad or upon motor cars there are many thousand miles of railroads in india the country has more than any other in asia and its railroad mileage is surpassed by only four other countries of the whole world its roads are well built and well managed and they carry several hundred million passengers each year the cars are much like our own except that in most of them the seats are long benches running lengthwise instead of across the car on each side a central aisle as with us other cars have compartments on the express trains some have electric fans electric lights and bells at one end of each car is a bathroom with a tub sunk in the floor so that we can have a wash as we go flying over the country at twenty-five or thirty miles an hour can we travel at night yes there are some sleeping cars but upon many trains we shall have to carry our bedding in such cases we must make a rush for the best places on entering the train the man who first gets his bedding down on a bench has the right to it and if we come in too late we may be crowded to the ends of the benches and have to sleep as we can the cars are of three classes first second and third those of the first and second classes are used chiefly by foreigners or well-to-do natives the third class is reserved for the common people who are packed in so tightly that it is almost impossible for them to move they pay less than half a cent per mile and the first class fares are cheaper than ours the conductors are usually natives they are tall dark-faced men wearing turbans and uniforms they speak english and are polite to all foreigners we are amused at the queer things we see on the freight cars here is one loaded with camels and there is another in which a baby elephant is shut off in a pen from the rest of the freight the brakeman tells us that elephant calves are charged for at the rate of six cents a mile and we wonder what may be the rate for a camel or a donkey in the baggage cars are compartments or boxes for cats monkeys rabbits guinea pigs and dogs all these animals are classed as dogs and paid for at the dog rate no one being allowed to carry anything of the dog class into the passenger cars not long ago a woman appeared at the depot with a turtle in her hand she was about to take the train when the hindu conductor stopped her she asked him why she could not take her pet into the car he thought for a time and then replied in his ungrammatical english yes missy can take cats is dogs and monkeys is dogs but turtles is fish and there is no rule against fish End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the wild animals of india one would not think a country so thickly populated could have many wild animals the peninsula of hindustan however has large tracts upon which little grows it has forests of teak and other trees the home of the elephant and vast jungles in which roam tigers panthers and leopards the jungles are composed of thickets of bamboo creeping vines and the dense brush found in tropical climates they cover the lower slopes of the himalaya mountains and are to be found also here and there upon and near the high plateaus of southern and central india from these wilds the tigers dash out into the farming districts 
and attack men women and children it is estimated that one thousand persons are annually killed by them the panthers and leopards and the tigers as well kill many cattle and sheep in a single year more than sixty thousand cattle have been destroyed by wild beasts india has also poisonous snakes which in some years kill as many as twenty thousand human beings so you see the country is by no means so safe as one might think considering its great population the wild animals are of many curious kinds there are monkeys large and small and leopards which have been tamed and trained to hunt other beasts there are crocodiles in the rivers and rhinoceroses in the swamps the rhinoceroses of the brahmaputra valley often grows to be five or six feet in height and the great horn on its nose sometimes attains the length of a foot and then there are the wild elephants which are still to be found along the base of the himalayas and in the hilly country not far from cape cormoran they live in herds feeding on grass bamboos wild bananas and the leaves and barks of certain trees it is against the law to shoot elephants and whosoever captures or injures one without the permission of the government is fined and he may be cast into prison the huge beasts are caught by driving them into stockades or by running them down with tame elephants ridden by men often a herd is driven into a stockade and the hunters go in to catch them this work is dangerous for if an angry elephant can get at the man it will jump upon him and kick him backwards and forwards between its fore and hind feet it may kneel upon him or by means of its trunk and feet tear his body from limb to limb india has many deer and antelope although the vast antelope herds of the past which sometimes numbered ten thousand or more have now disappeared it has the musk deer which secretes the musk fat from which comes the perfumery of that name and also many wild cats and dogs in assam on the edge of the himalayas are wild dogs which hunt in packs twenty-five or thirty of them going together when once on the track of an animal no matter whether it be a deer or a tiger these dogs will follow it for days and attack it when it is brought to bay i wish we could take specimens of the indian rat family home to show to our friends there are more than one hundred species some of which are as small as the tiniest mouse and others as large as a cat the bandicoot for instance weighs two or three pounds and often measures fifteen inches not counting its tail which is nearly as long there is another animal which we can find in almost any part of hindustan this is the jackal which looks like a very large fox it has a jaw so strong that it can crush bones with its teeth and its yell is like the scream of a baby it is a sneaking cowardly beast it will put its tail between its legs and run at the sight of a man although it may attack a child the jackal is the common scavenger of the towns and villages it feeds upon dead meat of all kinds and often fights with the vultures over a carcass the cat family is well represented in india and especially the larger cats such as lions and tigers there are more tigers than lions i once saw ten big bengal tigers in the zoological garden at calcutta one of which measured twelve feet from the tip of his nose to the end of his tail he was fresh from the jungle and consequently very fierce as i watched him the keeper put some meat inside the door of the cage and then went away the great beast pounced upon the meat when to see what he would do i poked my umbrella in through the cage thereupon he raised his head and sprang at me with a roar but was thrown back by the bars my heart sank and i jumped back whereupon the keeper came up and warned me that the tiger was a man-eater having already killed one hundred people most tigers however are not man-eaters they live upon deer antelope and wild hogs and kill also cattle horses and camels it is only when very hungry that they will attack men but it is said that having once tasted human flesh they prefer it to all other food a single tiger is known to have killed one hundred and twenty-seven human beings this tiger prowled along one of the chief public roads stopping all traffic 
until an english sportsman fired the shot through his neck which caused his death the tiger usually does his hunting at night he makes his lair in a jungle near a village or a corral where the cattle are kept after dark he creeps out until within a few feet of his victim and then with a spring seizes it by the throat often dislocating the neck in the case of human beings an old man-eater will sometimes grab a person by the shoulders with his teeth swing the body about over his back and trot off into the jungle to devour his living victim at leisure this animal is wonderfully strong the tiger can strike down a cow with a blow of his paw and drag her off with his teeth his claws are as white as ivory and as hard almost as steel they can be covered at will like those of a cat and are drawn in while walking that they may not be worn off by rubbing the ground tigers are not brave and they will usually run from a man rather than face him but when brought to bay they will fight until dead they will even spring upon the backs of elephants in their attempts to get at the hunters who are riding them the men often build platforms in the trees through which the beasts come to get food or drink they then climb up and lie in wait to shoot the tigers as they slip by a young buffalo or calf is often tied at the foot of such a tree the tiger pounces upon the animal and is sucking its blood when the hunter above takes aim and kills him have you ever heard of the cobra it is one of many poisonous snakes and about the most venomous known to man it is found all over india and it causes many deaths every year the cobra is not large seldom growing to a length of more than four feet although some are known to have been five or six feet long and six inches thick this snake has a small head which it expands in the shape of a hood when it grows angry it rises on its tail as it strikes and it cannot strike to a distance greater than its own length cobras sometimes crawl inside the houses not long ago an english lady was writing at her desk in her indian home when suddenly she felt as though somebody was looking at her from behind she turned around again and again but there was nothing in sight then at last on the floor she saw a cobra raising its hood-shaped head and about to spring at her she jumped upon the table and screamed for the servants who rushed in and the snake was killed we shall meet hindu snake charmers in all of the cities they are among the most skillful jugglers to be found anywhere and they handle snakes as though they were so many pieces of rope each juggler is naked except for a white turban and a strip of dirty white cotton wound around his waist he has so little clothes that it would seem impossible for him to conceal anything in them but nevertheless he brings forth from space as it were great bunches of snakes i remember a snake charmer i once met at delhi who was clad as i have described he asked me to hold out my hand and laid a piece of brown paper upon it he then took up a flute and began to play fixing his eyes on the paper as though he saw something there he danced around me for some time playing all the while and keeping his weird black eyes upon my hand he then started back and pointed at the paper my eyes followed his but i could see nothing he repeated this action dancing about more wildly than ever at last he dropped the flute and commenced to sing continuing his dance and pointing again and again at my hand all at once while i was still looking he thrust out his naked arm clapped his bare hand down upon the paper and snatched out of my very hand three great cobras he shook them and they squirmed and wriggled before my frightened eyes as he did so the cobras raised their hooded heads and darted out their fangs at me i jumped back for they were within only a few inches of my nose i could not tell then and i do not know now where the snakes came from i saw the trick performed again and again but i could never discover how it was done End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the cities of india today we are to see something of the cities of india there are many large ones and some of them are commercial 
and manufacturing centers calcutta madras and bombay are all great seaports at which hundreds of steamers call every year and hyderabad look now benares allahabad delhi and lahore are amongst the important trading places of the interior where vast numbers of workmen are making things for the markets at home and abroad the indians are a most industrious people being always busy in farming or in manufacturing of one kind or other they live in settlements large and small scattered over the country the homes of the farmers are in villages and not on the lands they cultivate as with us there are more than seven hundred and fifty thousand such villages in india and more than two thousand towns in addition to a great many cities each of which has fifty thousand people or more calcutta is as big as philadelphia bombay is bigger than boston and madras exceeds cleveland in size we shall begin our explorations with calcutta it was formerly the capital of the indian empire although it has been decided to move the seat of government to delhi in the interior the viceroy had his headquarters at calcutta for most of the year and there also lived the officials of the departments through which the country is governed calcutta lies on the hugli river which forms one of the mouths of the ganges being situated on the east bank about eighty miles west of the bay of bengal in coming in from the bay we sail up the river through jungles so low and unhealthy that they are given over to the tigers and other wild beasts which roam there at will a few miles farther up the stream the land rises and we now and then pass a mud village with palm trees waving above it as we proceed the population grows denser and we soon come into a region of mighty jute mills where bagging and other coarse cloths are manufactured for export to the united states and europe farther on we pass vessels heavily loaded coming in and going out and learn that the trade of calcutta annually amounts to hundreds of millions of dollars and that it has a great part of the foreign commerce of india which is more than a billion dollars per annum and is increasing each year the hugli is filled with shipping and it is in the midst of great steamers that we come to anchor in the heart of the city there are buildings on both sides of the river and on the east bank where we land they extend for miles up and down the stream and far back into the country we drive through a wide street and across a great park to one of the leading hotels it faces a public garden and is on the chow Ringe road which is lined with mansions and other fine buildings this famous city is sometimes called the city of palaces it has many magnificent structures the homes of british officials and wealthy east indians it has fine public buildings such as the post office the town hall and the high courts the palace formerly occupied by the governor-general is much like the white house at washington except that it is larger and grander it is situated at the end of a wide park known as the maidan which is several miles long it contains a racetrack and grounds for tennis cricket and golf at the upper end of the maidan is a zoological garden where one may see tigers which have been recently brought in from the jungle they are still wild and dash themselves against the bars of their cages as we come near here also are the botanical gardens where stands the great banyan tree so famous throughout the world the limbs of the banyan send down roots which penetrate the earth and grow into firm trunks or living pillars supporting the limbs from which they come the main trunk of this great banyan has a circumference of fifty feet and its branches extend far out on all sides from each large branch the roots have gone down into the ground so that it has altogether five hundred and sixty-two columns supporting it as we look at it it seems to be a mighty tent of green the leaves uniting and forming a canopy covering more than an acre when we lie down on the ground the support seem to be a forest of tree trunks of various sizes and as we raise our eyes we see that each is joined to a limb which runs out from the trunk almost horizontally overhead some of the roots are short they support the lower limbs others are twenty or thirty feet long 
and are joined to a branch higher up some are as thick as a man's leg others not so thick as one's finger some are as fine as a hair and sway to and fro in the breeze they are growing downward but have not yet caught the earth banyan trees are among the peculiarities of this part of the world we shall find them here and there as we go over india although none is so big as this great tree at calcutta driving back through the maidan we visit fort william a large stone-walled enclosure which forms the headquarters of the army it has many native soldiers whom we watch as they go through their drill we then ride on into the official and business quarters here the buildings are large and the stores are fine we stop at the post office facing a beautiful lake on dalhousie square and on its walls read an inscription which states that the marble pavement below marks the site of the black hole this was a horrible prison into which on the night of the twentieth of june seventeen fifty six at the command of the nawab who then ruled here one hundred and forty six british inhabitants of calcutta were cast and only twenty three came out alive that act created great indignation in england and an army was sent out to punish the nawab thus beginning the foundation of the british empire of india leaving the business section we go on to the river to watch the people bathing in the waters of the hugli which as they come from the ganges are considered holy and able to wash away sin we visit some of the temples and especially that of the terrible goddess kali after whom calcutta is named this temple is three hundred years old and the idol within it which represents kali has a necklace of skulls and about its waist is a girdle of dead men's hands the people are offering sacrifices to kali they bring in kids and goats which they kill in the court sprinkling the blood on her altar as we move about through calcutta we meet types of some of the many tribes of india the people are of all colors and each has a strange costume there are men from the himalayas with faces as fair as our own men from the northwest who are brown or yellow and some from the great central and eastern plains whose skins are as black as a negro's although they have features like ours there are brahmins or priests who go about with their heads shaved except for a tuft on the crown they wear only a sheet wrapped around their half-naked bodies there are mohammedans black and yellow wearing turbans and gowns clings the color of ebony clad all in white and cream-colored parsees the latter have brimless hats which look like inverted coal scuttles and frock coats buttoned up to the neck with skin-tight trousers below we see scores of half-naked black and brown babies at play in the streets and turbaned men dressed in white go by on the trot carrying burdens the vehicles are of every description there are carriages drawn by magnificent horses each with its coachman and footman riding on the box and with two servants on the step standing behind there are gharies or box-shaped east indian cabs pulled by lean horses and driven by men wearing liveries of gay gowns and bright-colored turbans there are carts drawn by cattle with humps on their backs and now and then we see a sulky like carriage to which is harnessed a bullock wearing a bright-colored blanket among the strange sights are the sleek fat bulls which roam through the streets the people consider cows and bulls holy and allow them to go where they please we see them walking upon the sidewalks and even eating at the vegetable stalls in the markets next to calcutta the largest city of india is bombay on the opposite side of the peninsula let us suppose ourselves there we are in a beautiful city of over a million built upon a cluster of islands about a magnificent harbor outside the town are great cotton mills and within are large foreign stores and hotels fine schools and an immense railroad station there is also a native section of shops and bazaars and suburbs where all sorts of manufacturing goes on there are many ships in the harbor and an extensive trade is carried on with europe africa and also with persia and other countries in asia at one side of bombay in a park upon a hill looking out over the sea are five white towers 
about which vultures are flying and to which we see a procession of men marching carrying a large white bundle which rests on their shoulders those are the famed towers of silence where the parsees lay out their dead the bundle the men are carrying is the body of a human being who has just died the body will be stripped and laid naked on the top of the towers and the vultures will eat the flesh and pick the bones dry the parsees are fire worshippers and this disposal of the dead is a custom of their religion they are a remarkable people there are only about one hundred thousand of them in the world but they are noted for their intelligence integrity and business ability they have banks in all the great cities of india and are to be found in the chief business centres of southern and eastern asia there are more of them at bombay than anywhere else the parsees came to india from persia generations ago and they still have the religion of the old persians which was founded by a man named zoroaster they consider the sun the highest visible type of the creator and worship fire as one of its emblems they believe in one god who they say is created for every person two spirits who are always engaged fighting for the soul they have been appointed to guard one of the spirits is good and the other evil and according as the man favors the good or the bad he will ascend to heaven or descend to hell the parsees keep fires burning in their temples and they have one at bombay which is said never to have gone out during hundreds of years madras the third city of india in size is situated on the west coast of the bay of bengal and about one thousand miles from calcutta it is a commercial manufacturing and educational centre being the chief seaport of southern hindustan it has a harbour protected by breakwaters but the sea is usually so rough that great steamers pitch about when close to the wharves and it takes some skill to land we go from bombay by rail to madras and later take the train to another great city which is ruled by the most powerful of the indian princes this is hyderabad the capital of the nizam who governs a country as large as kansas and inhabited by over eleven million people hyderabad alone having over five hundred thousand the city stands in the midst of a wild rocky country it has a huge wall about it which is six miles in circumference and this is entered by thirteen wide gates the people here are from all parts of india and among those we see on the streets are turks persians arabs and moors the nizam is a mohammedan and many mohammedans come to his country to trade during our stay we visit the palaces they cover many acres and house altogether about seven thousand officials and others their courtyards are full of armed retainers horsemen and servants of various kinds the nizam rules in great state his men wear gorgeous liveries and when he rides out it is often upon elephants and with all the splendor that the princes of india displayed in the past he uses also the automobile and motor car of the present and has his private car upon the railroads the nizam governs his country under the direction of the english although he has more power than some of the other indian princes whom we may meet farther on End of chapter thirty four